Welcome to First in Fiction, your first stop for learning to write fantastic fiction. I'm your host, Aaron Gansky, author of The Bargain, The Hand of Adonai series, and Firsts in Fiction. And I'm a co-host, Alton Gansky, just back from the coast to do this podcast. That's how much I love you guys. That's right. I left the ocean behind. And uh, good to be with you again. And I'm the author of about 45 books. And uh, Molly Jo is with us as our producer. Back again, Molly. Say hi. Hello. I am the First in Fiction producer. Uh, facilitating chat in the chat room so if you have any questions or comments I will let the team know and let's have a fun night and our guest tonight is Bill, Bill Myers. Myers. Who's taking that? Yeah. <laughs> it was just, it was Molly, just hanging I, there for a minute. I have, I have a question yeah. Molly. Yes sir. Uh, who, who's winning the Democratic debate right now? Um, I, I'm sorry am I supposed to care about that? <laughs> We just want people to know what it is we're giving up. You know, <laughs> it's Donald Trump, I'm pretty sure. I think yeah. he's talking <laughs> right. Stick to fiction yeah. there. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, All right. So some um, of you hearing the voice, especially you audio-only folks, you're hearing a, a new voice, and those on video can see Bill Myers. Bill Myers is our guest. We're hoping to have another guest here uh, who's part of this partnership with uh, the Harbingers and uh, novella writers. So and that's Angie Hunt. We'll introduce her uh, when she makes it in. And then... Uh, the other person we would like to have been able to have is uh, some uh, up-and-coming writer named Frank Peretti, uh, but he had to be out of town on business, so we weren't able to get him. But we do have uh, the the guy who thought all of this up for the Harbingers and the multi-book author, uh, multi-award winning author, film producer, who went to film school in Italy, of all places, and um, a man of many, many talents, Bill Myers. Good to have you with us, Bill. With a nice thick head of hair, you always leave that part out. <laughs> oh, I for, yeah, I forgot to check my my notes on that. Uh, okay, hi, it's good to be here. <laughs> well, we appreciate having you on, a uh, very esteemed uh, writer, and so uh, really kind of brings up the level of our podcast a little bit. So uh, <laughs> so far, we just have this hack named Gansky and this other hack named Gansky. So this will lend some credibility to our to our podcast, which is nice. Um, uh -huh. I don't know. I, I listened to your uh, one on short stories last week and uh, was busy taking notes and and buying books. So um, I'm looking was forward it, to learn something. Was Heather on that one? Heather Luby? Uh, nope. Uh, you had a, a fellow that you work with from time to time. Uh, on, Dennis uh, Fulgoni? On short stories, yeah. Okay, excellent, yeah. Um, see, all, the good ones are where we have guests, you know, so it's not just me talking. <laughs> uh, so. And with that in mind, let's uh, go ahead and toss it back over to you, Pops, uh, for our publishing term of the week. All right, I'm going to give uh, two terms here, unless I've already done these, Aaron. You know, I'm old, so these things kind of slip by me. Ple uh, Pleonasm and tautology, are those new? It would be very appropriate if you have done these already. So even if you have, I think you should go ahead and repeat them. Okay. I can't remember where I've taught these, so sometimes I forget. Two terms that you've probably never heard of, but I want you to get the names because you could be on Jeopardy someday. Uh, and they pertain to uh, editing errors, writing errors, composition errors, pleonasm and tautology. Sounds real fancy. Uh, let me just quickly explain what they is. Pleonasm means plenty of words. It's simply just using more words than necessary uh, to get an idea across. Um, uh, for example, uh, uh, she blinked her eyes. Well, what else would she blink? <laughs> um, uh, crouch down to the ground. Well, you can't crouch up to the ground. You know, so you take out those extra words. Um, they will often, and they will always make it into a book. There's always, I don't know how much hard I try, but uh, there's always one or two that gets through. You say it's because it's the way we speak. Pleonasm is just unnecessary words uh, to get the same idea across. Tautology, and the way to remember that. Uh, is the T because it means twice. That's how I remember it. It's using two words to say the same thing. Uh, free gift is a tautology. If it's a gift, it's free. If it's free, then it's a gift. So uh, it's unnecessary redundancy. And those are things that kind of eat up our writing, slow things down, bloat it. Uh, pleonasm, just uh, too many words, unnecessary words. Um, not to be confused with a few other things. Uh, but pleonasm means you're just using words you don't need. Tautology, you're saying the same thing twice, uh, usually with words that uh, join each other. Sometimes you can do it, uh, two sentences the same way, but in uh, grammar, 
composition tautology is using two words like free gift. And there you have it in short order. Can you there spell you. those words? <laughs> I, I can. Pleonasm <laughs> is P-L-E-O-N-A-S-M. Pleonasm, P-L-E-O-N-A-S-M. Okay. And tautology, you got to be careful about this because the word's also used in philosophy and many other things. Um, but as far as writing goes, uh, tautology uh, is using two words that you don't, uh, to say the same thing, same, saying the same thing twice. Uh, T-A-U-T-O-L-O-G-Y. T-A-U-T-O-L-O-G-Y. Okay. Tautology. Thanks. There you go. So you could be on Jeopardy someday. Need Excellent. to know what those are. Yes, but not with those questions. <laughs> I'll take tautology for 200. <laughs> you, have to, you have to figure that out. And then before. I'll just disqualify myself, thanks. <laughs> you, have to, you have to get those answers right before you can even get on to Jeopardy. Those are the qualifying questions. So. Yeah, and the, and the point is you don't need to remember the words. The point is just don't use unnecessary words. Um, that's really all it comes down to is uh, don't double up on stuff. Okay. Such as prepositions. I notice all the kids using got found some sort of two-for-one sale on prepositions because everybody's mm. chilling up in the club. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Grammar jokes. Here, well, let's let's get to something actually interesting. Why you guys tuned in? Talking novellas tonight, and uh, our guests, as you have heard, are, are authors of the Harbinger series, and uh, so they they've got a little bit of uh, knowledge about how to write the novella. And I'm really interested in this because I've always been fascinated with novellas. Uh, I really like them. Um, tried to write one one time. Not sure it was necessarily successful, but you guys. Have proven that it can be done, and and Bill, this is this really was your brainchild, right? So, um, just for those of our listeners who are unfamiliar with it, if you could maybe just give us a quick little rundown: what is the series about? Uh, what makes it unique? Oh, sure. Um, it's sort of a X Files, a spiritual X Files meets X Men, I guess maybe. Uh, it's uh, it deals with four people who have unique spiritual gifts uh, that uh, they don't even know that they have, uh, and they start to wind up in some very uh, spiritually dark hot spots, and discover somebody is uh, arranging and manipulating for them to come together into these hot spots and uh, put out the put out the fires. We have one character who. Uh, who is a black uh, street tattoo artist. Uh, we have an, uh, that's the character I play, a female, which is kind of fun. It's, it's, it's typecasting, isn't it, Bill? <laughs> it is. Being a black, sassy tattoo artist from the street. Uh, and these are all told in first person. Uh, so when I write my uh, novella, uh, it's all first person. And then Alton takes Al takes care of uh, uh, Tank. Tank is a football player, uh, sweet kid, uh, and has a gift of healing from time to time. That kind of surprises us all. Uh, we have a third character that Peretti plays, who's sort of a curmudgeon professor who doesn't believe any of this nonsense. And then Angie, uh, Angie Hunt, uh, when she writes writes from the perspective of a woman who sees patterns in everything. So when the four of us get together, the four characters get together, we wind up hopefully uh, making the world a little less dark as we're fighting the forces of evil. Uh, one of the things that, that kind of makes this series unique also is that um, we're all seasoned enough to know that if the four of us had to write one book together, we would kill each other. We're all fairly opinionated by now. So each one of us has a book all to ourself. So my character will write an adventure from her point of view, and she sees the other three characters not quite the same as they, say each, as they see each other. So it, it uh, kind of keeps us on our toes. There's a little bit of testosterone in the air, I notice, uh, as Preddy and Gansky and Myers and, and even Angie kind of try to outdo each other. Uh, in our books, so that's uh, that's kind of fun too. 
That actually brings up a, a really interesting question that I have that I will put on hold for a moment uh, because joining us now, uh, for those of you watching the video feed, you saw Angie pop in about halfway through that question. Uh, and so, Angie, thanks for joining us. Um, why don't you say hi and pops? If you want to give our listeners a little rundown on Angie. Well, Angie Hunt uh, is a buddy. and She's also on the East Coast, so it's late there. It's almost uh, my bedtime uh, where she lives, so um, a little late for her, but she's uh, one of the most uh, creative people. Singer has done that, has written uh, articles and, and short work when she first got into it and then started doing novels, uh, has won many awards, teaches, uh, and a very popular teacher at writers' conferences. Uh, has a lot of keen insight and a very wide range of abilities in writing. Uh, sometimes writers get kind of pigeonholed and do just one thing. Uh, Angie's proven over the years that she can write just about anything. And then somehow, I don't know if she owes Bill money or what, but she got pulled into this mess. <laughs> Say hi, Angie. Hi. I'm sorry I was late, and then I sat down, and, and I had all this to deal with. And But, but I'm here and happy to be here. <laughs> We are definitely happy to have you. So glad glad we got you dialed in. And um, so y you you mentioned uh, Bill. I now see. I knew this was going to happen. I was going to forget what the question that I was going to ask uh, about the the series. But um, one thing that I am curious about is is where this idea came from. Uh, is this just did it just hit you one day while you were driving, or is this something you'd been kind of thinking about for a while, or a movie that you watched? My background uh, is pretty much writing screenplays, and uh, so it initially started as a web series, which I hope it'll roll back into eventually, but until we find uh, the money for that, uh, writing books is a lot cheaper, and uh, Frank and, and Al and Angie uh, were on the top of the list as far as people that were agile enough and confident enough in their craft where they could try something new uh, and not fall apart if it falls apart. <laughs> you mentioned a web series. Are you talking about like a, a web video series or are you yes. talking more? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And Ori originally it was a, 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 about a five minute web series episodes and we'll get back to that I think eventually we've got some uh, pitching sessions. I live down here in Los Angeles and work in the film community a little bit, so we're we're still working on that. But in the meantime, <laughs> we're accumulating some pretty pretty out of the box stories. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm curious. I, I've interviewed several writers who have co-authored things. I've co-authored a couple of books myself, uh, and you mentioned that kind of seasoned writers tend to be very uh, perhaps set in their ways might be a nice way to say it but <laughs> I'm, I'm curious you approach these other writers pretty high profile writers as well and of course you are as well so you've got that respect for each other um, when you pitched this idea to them were they uh, originally a little bit reluctant were they excited by it how did you spin it to them to where you got them excited about a project that was kind of your brainchild and then also Pops and Angie if you could just weigh in after Bill talks um, about what it is that really kind of sold you on the project and why you wanted to come aboard. Well what sold me on the project was was the characters. I, uh, when I'm doing a series uh, whether it's for film or books first thing I do is spend a lot of time trying to come up with characters that you can put mileage on and want to keep seeing what's going to happen to them. Uh, so that was, that was I think, the high card with that. And I'll let Al and Angie address the other question. Pops, let's start with you. Yeah, I, I'm not even sure how to answer that, to be truthful. Um, Bill gave me a call, and he, he laid out this idea. He says, here's what I want to do. I want to have a five-member team, but we're going to write from four different points of view. We're going to have four different authors. It's not really going to be co-writing. We're going to be sharing uh, different kinds of. Uh, well, we're going to we're going to share the series, but we're going to do different points of view. They're going to have the same set of goals, but we don't even know what those goals are yet. And my first thought was, this this just can't go anywhere. It's going to be a big mess. It's going to be a problem. Sounds perfect for me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so like just the kind of stuff I'm used to. So, um, and the the whole premise uh, was interesting to me because one of the things that Bill pitched was there's a decline in attention span. Uh, in the United States, and a lot of people are having trouble getting all the way through a full book. Uh, by doing novella, things would move a little faster. We could uh, 
you know, provide a satisfying story in fewer pages and then keep changing up so you get different points of view and different styles of writing. And um, that was just intriguing enough to make me want to want to sign up, and so I did before before Bill could back out. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry, pops. I stopped paying attention. Um, I've got the short <laughs> attention span. So. All right. So, Angie, Angie, what is it that brought you along? Um, I just thought it was fun, and um, of course, I have the greatest respect for all these guys. They're all my brother dudes, and uh, I just thought it would be fun. And it's always fun to do something outside the box. You know, um, because I'm a woman, people expect me to write, you know, women's fiction and this kind of thing, and I enjoy doing that. But at the same time, it's nice just to be able to flap your wings and go off in a direction uh, that maybe no one has thought of before. So I thought it just sounded like a great experiment and that's what it's been and we're I'm enjoying it yeah excellent I, I agree with that I think as writers it's important to challenge ourselves I always tell my students I, I give them a daily writing task and sometimes they say oh can I change this can I change that and I say no well I don't like that I don't care like it's it's good sometimes to stretch your wings like you say uh, it, it challenges your craft so um, and I think this is pretty different for each of you because as far as I as I know you guys have written several novels perhaps some short stories and some screenplays and the like as you guys have said but has has any of you to this point written a not pops you've written a novel before or, I'm sorry a novella before this uh, but Angie have you done any had you done any novellas before this yes mm-hmm okay so in it wasn't fact, it's in fact Angie and I did one together mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of this idea sort of a he said, she said, of the first year of marriage. Uh, so she would write uh, one chapter as, as the uh, newlywed woman, and then I would write back as the newlywed uh, husband as we were uh, had our eyes opened wide to, to what it's like to share a life with, with uh, the strange and odd opposite sex. Excellent. Yeah, that's a great idea. I like that. And that um, was so Andy's. And that was Angie's brainchild. Okay, so it, so it wasn't completely new territory for any of you, um, but the fact that you're doing several of them is new. And one of the things that I think is intriguing, you mentioned the shorter attention span, but I think the novella is often faster to produce as well, and so it gives your audience something to look forward to. Uh, I remember the Aragon series and the entire readership waiting you know, two and a half years or whatever it was to get from book three to book four, and everybody's like, what's taking so long? I could have written the book by now. Um, and so there's that anticipation, but here you guys have four different writers, and so you're able to kind of space things out, um, and you have a certain amount of time to produce these, um, but it, that all boils down to the readership having less time to wait from one installment to the next. So I'm curious, who is it that that puts these things together? Who is it that kind of oversees like the release schedule um, and and puts all that to kind of together? Like who's writing first, who's writing second? I know you guys have your characters, but who decides who tells their story next in the series? Angie does most of the hard work. We uh, we, we go in a cycle. Uh, Myers, Gansky, no, Myers, Freddy, Gansky, Hunt, uh, and that's... That's close. About, that, <laughs> I'm number four. Oh, you're, oh, you're clean yeah, up. Yeah, I'm three. I'm you're the two. caboose. Yeah. So, but Angie's the one that uh, works uh, holding us together. She's sort of the um, the windy of, of us three Peter Pans. Well we said. We meet together about, I guess it's been about, what, once a quarter, once a cycle? We Skype, have a Skype session and talk about, okay, where we ended up in this cycle, where we want to go, and just so we kind of get an idea and we're not totally ping-ponging out there in the dark. So we do that, and first they were all a month apart, then we decided every six weeks apart, but I think... I got done early, and I know Bill got one done early, and Al is so busy he sandwiched us in. So, you know, it's kind of like you get it done when you get it done. So, so far it's working. 
it's also good for um, just keeping us uh, the craft just you know continuing to practice our craft instead of uh, having any type of downtime or you know so there's always if, I, if I'm between novels or between screenplays hey I'll just sit down and start working on the harbingers uh, so I'm always you know polishing my craft okay so you kind of continue in between projects here and there so you're kind of writing one of the things I was curious about is do you wait for the person in front of you in line to finish so that you can read that and have a good idea of what's going on in that novel or do you guys already do you send each other outlines so you kind of have a vague idea of where the stories are going do you hold each other accountable in that way um, or is it more just like your characters are so isolated that they're able to tell their own stories no I think we're you know we're pretty good on outlines when somebody has a story idea they put it out there and then they'll maybe put it out as an outline so we have an idea where they're going and then we start to to assemble around them a lot of times Al has the hardest job because we we throw all these balls up in the air and he goes what where do these come from yeah he's able to pull them together and add his own into the air so it's a little bit of a juggling act uh, but again that's between the three of us or the four of us counting Pretty, we've you know I don't know hundreds and hundreds of books and this is just kinda nice to to be on a high wire and, and do some tricks up there. No, absolutely. I, I think it's great. Um, I, I'm curious, what has the response been so far? Are we, are we selling a ton of books? Are we getting some good reviews out there? How's the series doing? You see, that's one of the advantages, uh, Aaron, is uh, we take turns reviewing each other's book, you know, putting <laughs> nice comments up on Amazon. <laughs> so that's how that works. Yeah, yeah. I'm lying, but it just struck me that'd be a fun thing to do. <laughs> I've been doing it wrong this whole time. That's how you do it. <laughs> so, uh, Angie, it, Again, Angie might be able to uh, address that better. I, 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 I don't read reviews, um, not because I'm a snob, but because I'm a weakling. If I read a good review, then I get all prideful. If I read a bad review, I get suicidal. It's a no-win for me. <laughs> so I, I, I just don't read them. I have a few people I trust. But Angie's pretty on top of the numbers and everything, aren't you? Yeah, the reviews have been pretty good. Of course, we wish the numbers would be a little bigger, but when you're self-publishing and it's only available online, I think you just you know, you just kind of have to slowly build a following. But uh, we've put each book up for pre-order as soon as we have a good idea of what it's about and so we can get a cover. And um, and the pre-orders are usually pretty solid. You can tell when everybody's finished. A book comes out and you can tell like when they finish that one and everybody puts in a pre-order for the next one. So, um, yeah, it's going well. It would We'd love it to triple, but, you know... Maybe over the can. years, <laughs> or after this can. podcast. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see how we can promote it over the next week and watch those numbers jump. Oh, we'd love and that. I've got a social media ninja that I can put onto that. So, uh, as a matter of fact, I just bought her a new plate. We keep talking about putting more on Molly's yep, plate, and yep. I show them the plate. plate. Uh, oh, that's uh, great! I laugh. This is the I, dollar section at Target, so you know I, I'm serious. I'm, I'm particularly thrilled that it's sectioned, so oh, yeah. you've got four got different you. things for your ninja to be working on now. Fantastic! That's <laughs> so. But I you am bought sure. a bottle of pills to go with it too, right? Ibuprofen, yeah. <laughs> Advil, yeah. something. Just a co just a, a cocktail. Just you know, you never know okay. what you're gonna get. So that works. Um, I'm curious yeah. though. You, all four of you, uh, have written novels, traditionally published novels. You've got awards. I don't know how many awards you have between the four of you. Uh, you've been in the business a very long time, um, but now you, this is not a traditionally published series. It's self-published. You guys have mentioned that a couple of times. Did did you consider trying to pitch this to a traditional publisher, or was this from the get-go? This was like, no, we're going to do this on our own. Uh, and if so, what was the decision behind that? How about, how about you, Bill? Oh, that was kind of a <laughs> um, question. How I, about you, Bill? Um, as I'm trying to be political here, as the market <laughs> shrinks, 
because we all write for the inspirational market. As that market shrinks, uh, there's uh, a tendency of everybody falling back on the for sure uh, sale, which usually involves something about Amish and something about women's love stories. Uh, none of those, I mean, we can write those, but none of us are particularly attracted to writing in that genre. So it, it seems if we're going to take a chance, if we're going to think outside the box, right now publishing is, is so uh, frightened that they can't think out of the box and survive or they're afraid to think <coughs> out of the box. So we, uh, we figured, uh, no, I don't think we ran this past a single publisher, did we guys? No, it was really set up to be uh, self-published because first of all, if we had gone traditional, it couldn't be coming out every month. They would be coming out you know, once a year. And, um, but with self-publishing, we can get a book, stick a cover on it, uh, one of the guys can hand it in to me, and it's on sale like 24 hours later. So keeping as close a schedule as we wanted to keep, self-publishing was really the only way to go. And I have to say, as much as I love the publishers I've worked with, I don't think any of them had enough faith that we could pull this thing off. So um, we'll see. Maybe someday somebody will want to buy them, but um, in the meantime, we're doing fine just the way we're going. You know, I, I, I'm tempted to think that as a, a traditional publisher with the, f the four of your names on a series, I feel like that would be a pretty easy marketing sell because uh, of your track records and, and the books that you guys have published and the awards that you've won. But uh, I like the point that you guys are saying that Sometimes traditional publishing is a little um, little shy about taking risks, and you guys are really taking the risk here on your own. You guys are investing your time, your money, your resources into this. One of the resources that I think is really important in self-publishing is editing. Have you guys hired outside editors, or do you guys kind of do that on your own where you guys each edit the other's book? How do, what does the editing process look like? Uh, Pops, I'll ask you. I can't speak for all of the others. Um... Uh, for me, I know Angie edits mine. Uh, I try to go through stages. I try to have my wife go over it, and then uh, I go over what she's gone over, and then Angie goes over it, and then we try to get you know maybe some other person to go through it um, with fresher eyes. And uh, then I sometimes edit the others. Um, uh, Bill's just came out, and I can't read and not edit, so uh, <laughs> I just just go ahead and throw the notes in and let them do whatever they want with them after that. Um, but one of the, the great things is they're all professional writers. So there's very little uh, debate about uh, how things are presented. Um, you know, the, you know, are, we, are we doing setting properly? Are we getting a good glimpse at the character? Uh, mostly they're, they're catching typos. And uh, you, know, you can tighten this sentence. And so all of that's, uh, all that's been very good. And, uh, but it, uh, I, I think it works. I start to say, you know, some stuff still gets out there, but that's true for... Uh, any book, Faulkner's uh, 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 book. Oh, I just lost it. Uh, the Great Gatsby had a hundred typos in it when it first came out. So, as long as we're below the hundred level on the on the first edition that goes out, and that's the other advantage of self-publishing. Uh, we can change it in an hour. Mm -hmm. um, it takes nothing to get it corrected and put up there. So if somebody says mm -hmm. you've got the wrong there there, um, it's it's easy enough to fix. So, I think it's working out great. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Pops, uh, I want to move now from a, a period of talking about the, the series specifically to more of the format of the novel. And you've got here in, in our show notes some, some breakdowns some, uh, of words, the number of words in uh, different uh, lengths of writing. So why don't you just kind of walk our, our listeners through that. What is the difference between a short story and a novella? When does a short story become a novella? When does a novella become a novel? Is there a particular breakdown or is it just kind of a, uh, depending on the publisher, what they feel like? Sure. One of the beautiful things in, uh, that originated in this idea, uh, with Bill's idea, was that it would be very much like a television series. You know, he mentioned the web series, but it, would, it could also be a television series and work like television where you have multiple writers working on the same you know, like Lost or some other show. Uh, and so you have to work together. You have to keep track of what the other person's doing, but you still have some freedom to do things. And that, the, 
the novella is ideal for that. So it makes for a quick read, and you can switch to the next uh, uh, writer and keep doing that. And that's mm -hmm. why we've combined this portion, the Harbingers, where we're talking about it, with a, a conversation about the novella itself and, and, and the power of the novella. Uh, and for me, that has been really the most difficult. I think when Bill first approached me, I think Bill said, uh, I said yeah, the, uh, it'll be about 15,000 words long. It takes me 15,000 words to clear my throat. So uh, <laughs> I thought, this is, this is really going to be tough. And I weighed in uh, at the longest one at that time, uh, and then others have surpassed me, which made me feel a lot better uh, about it. So that is the difficult thing, getting everything in there, a bunch of novelists writing short, things like that. Okay, so under your question, then how long is a novella? Uh, you're going to get different numbers where you, depending where you go, but here's the basic breakdown. A short story is something less than 7,500 words. Uh, sometimes you'll see the word novelette. That's usually in the sci-fi arena. You don't see many other publishers talking about a novelette. Uh, but a novelette would be from 7,500 to about 17,500 words. So uh, it's it's too big uh, for most magazines except story magazines, you know, like... Uh, you know, science fiction magazines or something like that. Uh, but a novella is around 17,500 words up to uh, a minimum novel length of about 40,000 words. Now, again, these are kind of wishy-washy, but it'll give you an idea. So a novella is about 17,500 words. I, maybe Angie can remember. I can't remember. My last one was 22 or something, like 22,000 one of them was just 25, so it, it can go all the way up to about 40,000, which is longer than what we're doing in these, but about 40,000 you get into the novel length. And as you move through the different genres, romance novels are shorter, westerns are shorter, uh, epic fantasy is huge, you know, 200,000 words, sometimes more. Uh, epic horror stories are the same way, so it'll vary from genre to genre. So a novella for our... our uh, point tonight is about 17,500 words, a little more, a little less, someplace in there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And and by that definition, um, you'd have some pretty famous books uh, that would qualify as novellas. The Old Man in the Sea, Animal Farm, um, Of Mice and Men, all of those would be about those lengths, correct? Yeah, Old Man in the Sea, 26,601 words. I counted every one of them. <laughs> okay, I, 26,601 words. That's Old Man of the Sea uh, by Hemingway. Orwell's Animal Farm, um, he got a little long-winded at 29,966, so I didn't feel too bad about my 25,000-word one. Christmas Carol, and one of the things you remember with this was Dickens traveled around reading this to audiences like audiences who go to movies. You know, So he's had to be long enough to entertain them for a couple hours, and short enough uh, for him to be able to do that in a single city. And that was uh, just under 29,000 words. And then of Mice and Men, Steinbeck was just a little over 29,000. So interestingly enough, mm -hmm. the most famous ones uh, are all about 28, 29,000 words, with the exception of The Old Man of the Sea, which is 26. Which is interesting. I, I think a lot of publishers might be leery of publishing novellas because they're worried that they don't sell. Um, I would think that they do sell. Uh, that link seems to be okay for those are some pretty top-notch uh, novels. We we just call them novels in, in literature. We don't differentiate necessarily between novella and novels, but um, yeah, those are definitely some short novels and some still some very very good ones as well. So there's I think a lot of advantages that you that the format has that novellas have for you each of you. And I'll start with Bill and then maybe over to Angie. Um, what advantages do you really see? The novella offering to a writer. Why would we be drawn to that? What uh, what makes it better, let's say, than uh, perhaps a novel or a short story? As far as improving our craft or challenging our craft. Sure, whichever you prefer. I mean, um, uh, to, to for a writing from a writing standpoint, and also from a reading standpoint. Well, I think from a writing standpoint, it it makes uh, at least for me, it makes me value the words a bit more, be a little more careful on the choosing of the words, uh, reveal more during, uh, during dialogue, other than just instead of working at one level at a time, working on multiple levels uh, where you're doing two or three things at the same time. Uh, so for me, that's probably the greatest challenge. Uh, not unlike uh, plays or, or screenplays where you're doing two or three things 
uh, simultaneously. So, so for the writer, that's for me. That's that's the best part, the fun part. Uh, and then for the reader, again, I think as as uh, our attention span gets shorter, and as um, particularly in this genre, uh, supernatural suspense, uh, you know, we're, we're not writing long literary pieces. So I think uh, I think it's it's kinder to the reader as well. Yes, what he said. Um, <laughs> for as a writer, it's well. I always have my little plot skeleton, and though when you're working with a form that's this short, you have to, you don't have room for subplots, and really you have maybe three major complications, and that's it. That's all you have room for. Now with our ensemble cast, I have to make sure that everybody in the cast is doing something and that they don't steal the show from my character because it's her time to shine but um, it just makes it a little it just makes it tighter it's it's the same plotting it's just not as much of it and you just draw the story in a little tighter and as far as readers I read Amazon reviews because I'm always curious about how they're reacting to what we're doing and they love it because they'll say you can read this in one sitting just sit down make yourself mm -hmm. at home get a cup of coffee or whatever and enjoy this so I think the readers are enjoying it so um, we'll keep writing them as long as they do we got a couple of comments in the chat room people saying that yeah they really appreciate the novellas because they can be read like that in one sitting or in one day and it's it's an easy read and I like that. I know I like to get through. I'm so busy to get through the entire story just boom all at once. Feels like good. I got something I can mark off the to-do list and I had fun doing it. Exactly. And I think this culture that we're living in, we're a video generation now as opposed to being a literary generation like 100 years ago or maybe 200 years ago. But we want story and we want it in 90 minutes or less. And for myself as a writer, I love reading other people's stories, but I have found that it's more beneficial for me at the end of the workday to watch a two-hour movie to get my daily dose of story than it is to sit down and read another novel because you can't do it at a night. Mm -hmm. So um, I just think this video generation that we're a part of and it's only getting worse as everybody wants a 140 word character tweet and a little tiny text message we just want tight and that was Bill's uh, brainchild and I think he was brilliant for coming up with this format. Excellent. So we talked about some of the advantages. I'm curious now what the challenges are. Obviously you have fewer words so I guess more specifically and Pops I'll start with you on this end and then we'll move back over to Angie and then to Bill. Um, what challenges does the novella present to you as a writer? Specifically where do you tighten the belt? You only have so many words. Are you cutting dialogue? Are you cutting setting? Are you cutting characters? Uh, you have mentioned before focusing on one plot element rather than trying to have multiple conflicts. So you've, we've, we know that you want to cut, cut back on the conflict and have one primary conflict. Do you also have to limit the number of characters and dialogue and, and imagery? Uh, how do you balance that, Pops? Yeah, it is, it is difficult. Uh, usually the first thing to go are subplots. So in a standard length novel there will be uh, a primary plot and there will be subplots and they'll uh, intertwine and then all end up at the conclusion and important for some reason or another with that. In the novella you don't have time to develop subplots. You can develop some characterization and we see that uh, all the way through these books where um, Pretty's character, the professor, changes some and then he backs off from that and goes back to his old curmudgeon self and then um, uh, there's depression and then there's just anger and then there's uh, uh, glimpses of uh, real tenderness in him. He's just very complex. Those things get developed through the books. Uh, so you can't take the characters out because it's all about character. Uh, uh, I, I don't differentiate between uh, uh, character-driven stories and action-driven stories. If you don't have characters, you don't have stories. So, um, so I think one of the things we've been doing is we've been focusing more on character and then one primary problem that fits the puzzle. There's a there's a big puzzle out there, um, and the team is having to figure it out. That's why we don't reveal everything in one book. It's because they haven't figured it out yet. And that's part of the joy of reading uh, these novellas is you're going to learn 
a little bit more, but you know you're not going to get the whole story yet. There's still more to learn, so the adventure continues. Uh, so dialogue really moves, characterization, uh, sometimes less on setting. In my last one, I had to do more setting because of the storyline. Um, and a lot of uh, narration gets tightened up. I don't know, does that make sense to the rest of you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about um, you, Angie? If the ball's bouncing to me, um, here are the things that I found myself leaving out. Introspection, sometimes in a novel, particularly a, a women's fiction, you have quite a bit of introspection as a character's thinking and muddling over her choices. You don't have a lot of room for that here. And um, description, of course, we're fortunate in that this is a familiar age, that these are contemporary stories, because we don't have to ever describe anything that the reader's familiar with. So that helps a lot. And then backstory, we may make a casual mention of uh, an episode that's gone before or the one right prior to, but we don't ever really spend much time on backstory of our character or anybody else's character unless it's going to play into the present story. So um, we just try to keep it moving, keep it moving. I think the last story I wrote, Infiltration, had it was long. I think it was 25,000 words because I felt like at some point we had to pull in the reins and talk about the gate, our enemy. And so Andy kind of does some research and they take two or three days to, to research the gate. And I just felt like at this point we had to lay that out for the reader so they'd know who it was we were fighting against. But um, And we might need to do that ever so often, just have a kind of a breather for our characters so they can sort of stop and take stock. But um, but not very often. Most of the time they're rather episodic and, and there's a main problem, as Al said, in each book. Excellent. How about you, Bill? Uh, for me, the most fun is, is the dialogue. Uh, I love writing dialogue. I love telling the story through dialogue, making it dance and not just, you know, be pragmatic or, or, or revelatory, if that's the right word. So um, it, it, it's tightening up my dialogue skills even more. Uh, the fact that she's uh, uh, from the ghetto, my character's uh, from the ghetto, that she's uh, a different culture than I'm used to, I, I'm enjoying that a lot too. Uh, what am I leaving out? The stuff that bores me when I read a book, uh, I don't think uh, there's more than three or four or five sentences describing the clothing of a character in, <laughs> in the entire piece. The stuff that, um, yeah, just the stuff that bores me so I can have, uh, have fun with, uh, with the characters instead. Who is it that said that fiction is life with all the boring parts taken out? Hmm. Like, I, it's a great quote, and I can't remember who said it. Somebody in the chat room will pro probably let me know. But um, good point. I mean, obviously, if it's boring you as a, as a reader, then you don't want to put it into your fiction. Um, great answers. Now, I am really curious. We're kind of running out of time, and we do want to get to the, the questions that the room have. But I, I've got one last question for you guys. Um, where, How do you see the, the future of the novella? Do you see this as a, a growing market, especially with self-publishing? Is this something that you think our listeners um, should pursue if they've got an idea for a novella? Um, should they maybe try and change their novel into a series of novellas, maybe a trilogy of novellas? Uh, or is your face still predominantly in the novel as our primary means of entertainment fiction? Uh, we'll start with Bill and then we'll work back to Pops. That's a great question, and I don't have an answer for it. I, I don't know what the future holds uh, for books in any way, shape, or form. You don't have a little crystal ball over there, a little crystal book that you can I just kind of don't. divine? I don't. I usually just call Al for that, and he tells me. Okay. <laughs> and, and I make it up, so... <laughs> and then he calls Angie. So you call Pops. Pops calls Angie. Is that... Is, it, is that the end of the rabbit hole there, Angie? Are you the end of the rabbit hole? Where, circle. Yeah. 
What, what do you think, Angie? Is there is there a future for no, novella writing? I think there is because just the other day I read a blog piece. Um, it was on the book bub blog. That's hard to say quickly, um, but it was a a very well done piece about selling books in sets, like box sets, except they're these are digital books, so the box is not literal. But by people are putting three or four books together that are joined by a theme or a genre, and readers love these sets because the price is usually cheaper. You get four books instead of one for a better price. And um, so I think a novella series or collection is exactly the same thing. And Fast reads, I think, are popular and are going to continue to be so. And I think it's really smart to put these things as, to market them as box sets. In fact, when we did the first four books, we put them together in a single book, um, called it Cycle One Invitation, because they were being invited to this enterprise. And then the second set I just put together, and I'm put them, the little graphic image is actually a boxed set and that has all four novellas in it and so we're marketing it that way. Cycle two. What did we go with? Amalgamation? No. Mosaic. Mosaic. That's right. Mosaic. So um, I think they're very popular because they're perceived as value for the dollar and it is. It's a great entertainment value for the buck. So mm -hmm. sure. Absolutely. Pops, you you agree with that? Yeah, I do agree with that. Uh, novellas used to be book, uh, be big in publishing. Uh, the problem is it's hard to make much money per unit, and, and a lot of this is just straight business. Um, and so that began to fade out. It's still You still get a good deal of novellas around the holidays. Um, but the truth is we get our entertainment in short order, from short order cooks. You go to a movie, uh, and if it's a comedy, you, you get about 90 minutes. If it's uh, a drama, it's two hours. If it's an epic drama, it'd be two and a half, maybe more uh, hours. But it's really all in one sitting. They don't even do intermissions anymore. Uh, it's all done in one sitting. Television is the same way. An hour program is 43 minutes, um, 44 minutes. Half hour program is you know, 22, I think. Something like that anyway. But so uh, people are now digest story on a regular basis in bite-sized uh, increments. And so I think, especially now because we can do this without traditional publishers, because they have more things binding them, uh, making it difficult for them, we as writers are free to do it. We don't have those chains on us. And uh, we can write whatever we want to write and get them out and do it in bite-sized increments that uh, are pleasing and make people want to read the next one. Well said. Well said. Uh, Molly, the room has been very active tonight. Uh, yeah. What questions have popped up or, or comments that uh, we should be aware of? Well, first of all, I think from now on we have to have Al spell the publishing terms of the week because everybody was really happy that I asked you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good to know. And then when I put it on Twitter later, I won't make a fool out of myself. So thank you. Um, Tess DeGroot likes the idea where each of you is writing a different point of view in the same story. She thinks that's pretty great. Um, Jenny Snow is asking each of you, what are your recommendations on how much you should charge on Kindle for novellas and short stories? For example, she's working on a short story compilation that will total about 12,000 words. Is two ninety nine too much for such a short book? I would go with a dollar a word. That's my going rate. Um, and that's why you're not the marketer. Okay. Uh, then I'll let the professionals answer then. Yeah. <laughs> that if sounds like an Angie question. Angie. Yeah. If this is a new author that doesn't have a strong following, I would charge 99 cents. If it were a known author, I would charge a dollar ninety nine and have frequent specials at ninety nine cents. That's my opinion. Okay, good advice. Okay. Angie, she also wants to say she read your Heirs of Kahira O'Connor series in junior high. It completely <laughs> it captured her imagination and helped shape what kind of woman she wanted to be in her own real life. Wow. She says she loves your writing. Well. 
thank her very much. All right, Jenny, way to go. Um, reading up, Tess DeGroote, she, uh, I know her, she's a friend of mine. She writes novels or novellas, and she's very good at it. She says the novella length works for her when she tries to make it novel length. It seems forced in places. Then we got to the part where Aaron showed off the plate for his social media ninja, and yay, people are excited for that. <laughs> yeah. It's like you're <laughs> excited about that. Yeah. Can I just say that the ninja herself is slightly worried about if that plate comes empty or stacked with piled on stuff? Oh, it's coming stacked. It's All coming right. stacked. <laughs> Vitamins and Advil. That's, that's all I need to get through it. Um... Looking at Marie Bast was in the room. She enjoyed the podcast. She says she likes to read the shorter ones. And that looks like that is about it. Oh, Jenny is asking, have you as writers figured out all of the problems in the overall story for the Harbingers? Do you have the end of the series in mind? Or are you still deciding the plot as you go from book to book? Yes. Which <laughs> one, though? All of them. Is That's a... Uh, okay. <laughs> No blanket answers here. You have to explain yourself. <laughs> is, Bill, is there an end game? Uh, do you, have you guys kind of brainstormed that together where you, you guys are all working toward the same ultimate end, uh, but the path you take to get there is perhaps different? Uh, how, did, I, how did you guys work that out? Yeah, I, I think we have a, a general end game. We have an antagonist organization, so I think eventually we're going to track them down and uh, hurt them real bad. But uh, we're nice. We're handling it lightly. We're not. Uh, you know, we're all having fun, so we're not working in a real tight form. But eventually, yeah. If if we're all fed up with the thing, then we'll uh, we'll finally destroy the bad guys. So good, good wins. Good guys win. I, I, is that a spoiler? Did I ruin that? I ruined. I don't know. So, but we'll have I think to see. We you might guys. have known that one already. Yeah. It was well, news to me, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, let let let's let's say they um. They they put out the major fire, but there's still sparks afterwards. Ooh, there's well, going to be an epic battle, right? There's always an epic battle. Yeah. How about those Dodgers tonight, huh? What oh, yeah, don't don't, Shut don't look at me. I don't have a spoiler territory. Uh, who's winning the Democratic debate? Did we ever figure that one out? The no. Dodgers, yeah. The Dodgers are, okay. And this so. is important, why? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Aaron, your quote was, Caro Clark, good fiction is life with all the boring bits taken out, not with all the hardship taken out. Ah, uh, that actually is a lot more intelligent than what I said, so thank you, Caro Clark, for that. And uh, I know comparable... I a comparable quote Tess put up was Alfred Hitchcock, movies are real life with the boring parts cut out. Yeah, so I, I remember all the quotes. I just can't remember who said them. I was always bad at history, um, and apparently quotes. So, well, we are uh, pretty much out of time. This was uh, a fantastic podcast. Thank you, uh, Bill and Angie, for for joining us. Uh, but before we sign off, I always like to let our listeners know where they can find more of your writing. Obviously, on Amazon.com for the Harpingers series. Um, but Bill, where can uh, where can our readers get in touch with you, or our listeners get in touch with you? Uh, BillMyers.com, M-Y-E-R-S, uh, and I try to answer all my email, so it would be uh, yeah, BillMyers.com. Excellent. All right, and Angie. Um, there's a contact link at AngelaHuntBooks.com or Facebook. Okay. Facebook's always nice. Pops, how about you? Yeah. Folsom Prison. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been traveling all day and I'm tired. My wife made me go on a four-mile hike this morning before we left the coast. So, uh, Altengansky.com, and uh, that usually bridges to everywhere. Uh, the, the real writing stuff is over at uh, the Blue Ridge Mountain Christian Writers Conference. So that's brmcwc.com, brmcwc.com, and that's where. Uh, most of the writing, and there'll be more posts going up uh, as we move through the year. gets much more active. Absolutely. And Molly, our producer and social media ninja, uh, how can people get in touch with you? My blog and contact can be found at uh, franklymydearmojo.com. 
you can send me all, all my contact links are through there or pretty much just uh, search Facebook for me search Aaron's Facebook page drop him a line I'm pretty much the one who's gonna pick that up and find it uh, if I fall off the face of the earth that's never gonna happen because nobody will let me there's too many other people that know where I'm gonna be <laughs> but generally it's uh, frankly my dear mojo.com and if you contact her through her social media channels uh, you can get her mailing address so that you too can send her another plate. Oh yes, more. I so love plates. Please she's, send she's me more plates. She's collecting plates. So, and as always, you guys can get in touch with me at AaronGansky.com or the Facebook or the Twitter. And we thank you all for listening. Oh wait, 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 wait! Next week, next week, join us. Heather Luby will be here, and we're going to talk about the seven deadly sins for writers. Seven deadly sins for writers. So, thank you all for listening, and until next week, good writing.